Have you ever been concerned that your voice is too nasally or not nasally enough? Today we're gonna break the myth of nasality, talk about what it sounds like, what it doesn't sound like, and how that can help you achieve your vocal goals. I've been in this trans voice space for a long time and I've worked with individuals in the trans community who have been working on their voice for 40, 50 years in some cases. So it's just amazing to me that everybody thinks this sound is a very nasally sound. That really buzzy, twangy, brassy context, that is not inherently nasality. But this myth has penetrated so deeply into our cultural consciousness that even high level singing teachers will identify a very buzzy sound as more nasally. And this is especially bad because in the trans voice community itself, not teachers, but in the community itself, when people go and they seek feedback from their friends and they post a voice that's a little too buzzy like that, they get a wall of comments from people in the community saying, oh my gosh, that's quite nasal. You should try to be less nasal. And now it's sending them on a wild goose chase because that is not inherently nasal. Nasality. Yes, adding nasality can make you buzzier sometimes, but it's dependent on other factors occurring simultaneously. And so we have to do away with this idea of writing all buzzy sounds as nasally. It is just not true, it is not useful, and it does not reflect what is actually occurring and what we can actually sense. So now that we've gotten some common misconceptions out of the way, what is nasality? Nasality is actually a range of different qualities that we can add, remove, and influence in our voice. That range of sound quality is controlled by how much airflow we permit to pass through our nose while we vocalize. Let me go ahead and show you this sound here. This is what it sounds like if I add nasality while I'm doing that. And this is what it sounds like if I remove the nasality back to a regular level. And then here's what it sounds like if I don't have a deaf nasality while I do it. We can hear that I could add nasality and it created that murmurous effect. We could hear that I removed the nasality and it created the stuffy effect. And you could hear that I could balance pretty nominally and it created a pretty regular effect. So we have a little doorway in the upper part of our mouth and throat called the velopharyngeal port. And it's controlled by our soft palate. Maybe you've heard that before or our velum. If you shine a flashlight in the back of your throat, you'll see your little uvula hanging from some soft tissue. And that soft tissue curves back, forming a doorway into the nose. And what happens is when we vocalize and that soft palate is lifted and that doorway is closed, there will be no nasality present in the sound. When that doorway is hanging open or it's accidentally cracked open, then we will start to get more nasal airflow and that will influence the way that a person sounds. Now, we don't wanna think that having some nasality is bad or not having it is good. It doesn't really work like that because it's conditional and contextual on what's happening in your voice. For example, I speak English and there are really three consonant sounds in English that have to be produced with nasality. Those are the M, M, the N, N, and the NG. Mm, as in song. Mm, mm. In order to even produce those sounds properly, I have to allow nasal airflow and nasality to enter into the sound. If I don't, they won't sound right. For example, if I say my mom, but then I delete that nasal airflow and I become hyponasal, here's what we hear. By Bob, by Bob, by Bob. It doesn't sound anything like the intended expression of my mom. Now, likewise, if I say sounds that don't have any nasality present in them, but I accidentally place it, I will also sound a little off. So for example, the phrase fear doth love, love doth fear, there's no M's, there's no N's, there's no NG's in that. So technically there should be no nasality. So for example, if I say that, fear doth love, love doth fear, and then I say it with hypernasality and I add in nasality that I don't need, it'll sound like this. Fear doth love, love doth fear. Fear doth love, love doth fear. You hear how now all of a sudden I sound a lot warmer? I sound a lot duller and a lot like more blanketed, right? Adding nasality actually makes us sound warmer darker, there's like a murmurous muted tone. It sounds muffled, it loses a lot of clarity. And it's one of the things that we typically try to avoid in most of our speech and most of our practice. If I were to sing a passage with nasality, it'll sound like this. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies. Hear how it's womp, 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 it's muffled. As opposed to blocking that, so like here I've got a lot of nasality and then I've blocked that. So now you can hear it's a very clear sound, it's very focused, it's a lot sharper, and there's greater resolution in the pronunciation and articulation of all of it. Now by contrast, when you're sick and you sound stuffy and someone goes, wow, you sound so nasally, 
No, you don't. You sound like you don't have enough nasality or regular nasal behavior when you're speaking. And so it just draws attention to that quality. And this creates a little bit of a dilemma for us because a lot of people will try to intentionally over control their nasality or hyponasality too much. And the fact that sometimes we need nasality and other times we don't makes this an interesting feature because you shouldn't be trying to over control it or micromanage it. The velum or soft palate opens and closes while we speak pretty subconsciously. It's just baked into how we associate the production of speech. And so us trying to manually get back there and shape it and control it while we're speaking creates way too much interaction for us and way too much diversity to try to handle throughout each action. Now, there are individuals who from their childhood speech development onwards, they happen to have idiosyncratic behaviors of nasality. Some people are hypernasal. Here's a really famous voice that actually really rose to success in Hollywood because of her nasality, Fran Drescher. I will let you know when dinner's ready. You? Yes, me. Now go, go. I'm perfectly capable of getting dinner on the table. Hello, Fang Lams. Do you deliver? Does this look familiar? And so you can see it's not that nasality only happens when we're doing something wrong. It's just a type of articulation that we can modify and change around. Now, functional nasality is gonna sound like typical speech. There's not really a quality that we associate with it that makes it stand out. On my M's and N's right now, my velum is slightly cracking open and the air flows coming through my nose. And then when I'm not producing those sounds, my velum is sealing and allowing the sound to have that sharp that we associate. Nasality is only coming in when I need it, and nasality is coming out when I don't need it. Now, let's take a look at some basic explorations to help get our ears, our mind, and our body around what nasality is and how to interact with it. First, a very simple check. For anyone out there who's really just concerned that they're too nasal to begin with, one easy way to check that is to say a phrase without any nasality present, such as fear doth love, or you could say a single word like log, which has no nasality. And then all you have to do is pinch and unpinch your nose. If you're nasal at any point, it's gonna change how you sound because then you're manually blocking that nasality with your fingers, like so. If I say fear doth love, fear doth love, it won't change very much. Fear doth love, love doth fear. Fear doth love, love doth fear. Fear doth love, love doth fear. You hear how that's not changing. In contrast, if I were to say, my mom, my mom, my mom, my mom, my mom, my mom, hear how that's now, it's fluctuating as I disrupt that nasal airflow from occurring. So I just wanna get that out of the way first. That is a super simple way to check if you are nasal when you shouldn't be. Now, another exploration. Let's go ahead and try to simply say the word log log, 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 and then slowly morph that into the word long, long. Really the predominant difference between those two words is if there's nasality or not. So for example, if we say log, 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 and slowly morph that into long, we will hear nasality enter. Log, 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 long, 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 long. Hear that dull, murmurous hum that starts to come in the background? That is the sound of nasal airflow present in your voice. Now, if we were to go the opposite direction and seal that up, we could say long, 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 log, 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 log. Do you hear how much more punchy that non-nasal version is? This is a really simple way to play with and experiment with adding and removing nasality from a similar condition in the voice. Another one that we can do, for example, can be ba versus ma. So I could say ba, 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 ba. And when we're doing a ba, there shouldn't be any nasality. And so that's what allows us to build that pressure, that spiky ba, 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 that punchiness of ba. Now, if I slowly convert that to ma, that will go away and we'll get a persistent tone occurring, like so. Hear how even when the mouth is closed now, there's still sound rushing through because that air has somewhere to escape to since we have now opened our nose. So these are a really simple, basic way to play with adding or removing nasality from an otherwise similar vocal context. Log versus long and ba versus ma. 
So play around with those and see if you can sense that delineation in the sound. Listen really carefully for that effect entering and exiting when you do it. What's really fascinating about this is how automatic our control of the soft palette is. And that's why just thinking about the voice on a biomechanical level doesn't actually translate into, can we do that as a vocal ability? Because if you're having trouble getting rid of nasality, what if I told you that every time you hold your breath, you seal your nose off? So for example, just be relaxed and focus on what you sense when you do this. Gently breathe in through your nose and then hold your breath. You might feel like there's a doorway that shuts and everything kind of closes off. The sensation that we feel from when we're just idling with our nose open is a lot different than when we're idling with our nose closed. And in fact, once you've done that and you're holding your breath and you can feel that, try to push a little bit through the nose, but resist it like so. And now I'm opening and closing, letting little bursts of air come through the nose. And that's literally me just cracking that soft palate open and closed, causing it to build up and release that pressure. So you can try this. You can go. See how that's very punchy and that air is getting displaced very quickly. That's because I'm building up pressure since the air has nowhere to go. Then I'm suddenly giving it an escape path by opening that velum and whoosh, it rushes out. So don't think this idea of controlling nasality is some difficult task with your physical body. Your physical body knows how to do this. It does it all the time. When you go to jump into a pool, you hold your breath, your velum seals off. That's what stops us from having the water rush all the way through our nose because it's sealed off. And so our solution to problems of nasality don't come from recognizing it as a physical behavior in the body. They come from recognizing its effect in our sound. Another example of our body's intuitive ability to seal our nose and raise that soft palate is whenever you're around a really bad smell, maybe a baby's messy diaper or a stinky dumpster. We could kind of block our nose and go, oh my gosh, that's, it smells so bad. We stop breathing through our nose. And in fact, even after we're stopping breathing through our nose, we can still sense that smell until we completely block it off. We stand by the stinky dumpster. We go, oh my gosh, that smells so bad. And you can hear when I do that, that hyponasal property starts to enter the voice once again. And that is the clue that tells us we do not have nasal airflow anymore, even when we should. We can see all these really intuitive behaviors of how we can physically control that, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be able to get the effect that we want in sound. So play with the vocalized versions of nasality and that will give you the best control over it. Another exploration, which I find to be perhaps the most useful is taking basic spoken vowels and then adding and removing nasality from them. In general, in English, Unless there is an M, an N, or an NG, all of our vowel sounds should be non-nasal. So if you're saying ah, ah, if you're saying e, e, all of those are implied to have little to no nasality whatsoever. So what we can do is we can take those neutral vowels and then we can try to make them more nasal, more murmurous, more dull, and that will give us the sense of adding nasality when we don't need it. And then we can remove it to understand how to get rid of it if we don't need it. Like so. Ah, ah, ah. When nasality is present, ah becomes ah, 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 ah. Sort of that stereotypical French quality that we hear a lot in American media. Ha, ha, ha. That's literally just ah, ah, ah with nasality present. If we take a look at the E vowel, E, 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 and then I add nasality to it, it will sound like this. E, E. E, 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 e. Hear how that becomes duller, more murmurous. There's almost like a blanket that's placed over the vowel. And we can try this with other vowels. Ooh, 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 Hear how whenever I add nasality, it just gets a lot less crisp, a lot less sharp. It's more muted, muffled, blanketed, it's duller. And this is actually why so many people get confused and think nasality is a buzzy sound. Inside my own head, when I add nasality, 
it does tend to sound brighter and buzzier to me. So from a first person perspective, nasality is pretty bright and intense and buzzy and ringy internally, but externally for everyone else, it tends to just sound duller and more muffled. And sometimes it can sound bright, but that's gonna implicate other things which are controlling that. But that's why we tend to see this misnomer and misconception about what it sounds like. And lastly, the most important exploration that you should make when it comes to nasality is adding and removing it from the context of voice you actually care about. So if you're working on speech, work on adding and removing it in speech. If you're working on singing, work on adding and removing it in singing. Let's take a look at the singing context. If you go to sing a, a single vowel or single note, we just identified that all of our vowel sounds are non-nasal in English, which means if you have any nasality present when you are singing regular vowels, which are the core of what we sustain on in singing, that's either going to be a stylistic thing that you're choosing to do, or it's a problem that you don't realize that you have. Now, let me go ahead and just do a singing note with a lot of nasality. So if I were to sing like ba ba da ba and then I were to be nasal ba 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 it just makes me sound a little amateurish, a little crude, a little bit of nasality in singing it can sometimes be stylistically effective. And in fact, we see that a lot in like qualities like that, where they get sort of buzzy and they get sort of like nasally and kind of warm like that. We see that a lot in like butt rock, a little bit in country. We'll see nasality creep up and singing all over the place. But in general, a good rule of thumb is to try to avoid it unless you are singing an M sound, an N sound, or you're phonating around an NG in your voice. Just a footnote, a section of the population does have different soft palate physical issues. And so some individuals are hypernasal because that's just how they learned to talk when they were younger. Some people might be hypernasal because of certain physical challenges in creating a perfect seal with their velum. If you're one of those individuals, don't stress it. Yes, we want you to be able to get rid of nasality when you don't want it and have it when you do want it. But at the same time, it's not gonna extremely impact your ability to achieve your feminization goals. It will change the overall profile of sounds you can get. But as we heard with Fran Drescher, she doesn't sound not feminine and she's still quite nasal. So it's more so a cosmetic element and a functional element that we have to be cognizant of. So it is an important element, but we don't wanna think, oh my gosh, a little bit of nasality, I'll never achieve my goals. But also if you are getting nasality or a lot of nasality when you're working on feminization or masculinization, that's telling you that you are accidentally doing something wrong that you need to try to solve so that you can have a wider range of sounds. Essentially, when we block off the nose with our soft palate and we only have an oral sound quality coming out, we have way more control over the sound because then it's purely going through our mouth, which means we can influence it with our articulation, our lip shape will influence it more, and overall the voice will have more control and range of quality that we can get to. We can change almost anything about our voice when it's coming through our mouth, but if it's coming through our nose, we're forfeiting a lot of that control that we have. That doesn't mean that we can't control our nasals and modify those as well, but it is a different degree of control we have when we are submitting to nasality versus really controlling it and keeping our voice really clear. In fact, I'll just go ahead and demonstrate this. So here's an example of masculinizing and feminizing the voice in a nasal context. So we can hear how, even if you're completely nasal, it's not gonna shut you down from achieving effects. Mm, 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 mm. So we can still get a wide variety of qualities in a nasal environment. Now, of course, if I were to do that on a sound that shouldn't have nasality but does, it'll be a little bit more limited of a range, but we can still get a lot of effect, like so. Oh, oh, oh. There's that nasal aw that we identified before. One, two, three, four. So now you can hear I'm like still pretty nasal, but it's not like I can't get qualities that are like okay ish or whatever or closer to our goals. It's just that it's always going to have that sort of murmurous hum. You hear that thing in the back. And if I can clear that up, then obviously I can have more control and more sharpness and depth to the sound overall. So let's recap for a little bit. Nasality is a range of sounds which tends to occur most notably to us when we're actually doing doing something outside the average. Average nasal behavior is not that noticeable. We allow the soft palate to lower and give airflow into the nose on our M sounds, our N sounds, our NG sounds. And then we close that right back up and move on with our speech until that occurs again. If 
The nose is open when it shouldn't be. We tend to perceive that as a dull, warm, murmurous quality to the external, but it sounds kind of bright and twangy on the internal. We call that hypernasality, and it indicates that we have too much nasality or nasality is too present for that given functional context. And inverse to that, we have hyponasality, which occurs whenever you should have nasality, such as in an M sound, an N sound, or an NG, but you're actually not allowing that nasal airflow to occur. That tends to make you sound stuffy and blocked. And so we can see that both of those wings of this idea of nasality tend to be qualities that we look at more as problems that we'll want to typically avoid. And then in the middle, it's not really a notable quality. It just gives us that sharpness and clarity. A lot of individuals create their own nasal problems when they go to feminize their voice or change their voice intentionally because they're trying to manually control their body around. And if you manually control your body around, you'll stop doing a lot of function behaviors that you should be doing and they happen automatically because you're putting such a heavy hand on the voice overall. And so this is especially true with nasality. Oftentimes when people try to manually make their vocal tract change or manually manually control their resonance to change their vocal tract, if they're thinking very physically about it, they'll often open up their nose on accident when they normally wouldn't make that mistake at all. So we have to be oriented around what we hear, not what we think we're gonna be able to make the body do when we consciously try to force it to do an action. Because whenever we try to manually control a muscle, we tend to affect a whole broad section of muscles and other qualities around it and disrupt the regular behavior that we have with the voice. We want there to be this regular behavior behavior with the voice in general when we're working on nasality. So it's important to hear the quality and work on adding and removing different degrees of hypernasality and hyponasality. All solutions to this start from being able to hear. If you don't know how to listen for this and you don't know how to identify the sound or hear the sound, it doesn't matter if you do physical tricks to get your soft palate to raise and then you just try to hold it there when you go to phonate because then if you're not doing it, you won't be able to detect it adequately. So we have to be able to hear that range of quality and then go play with that range of quality in our own voice, create that range, and that will give us that control to identify if we have any problems forming which shouldn't be present in the beginning. So thank you all so much for watching this video. I hope it was really helpful in dispelling some myths of nasality, giving you some auditory examples to listen for hypernasality, hyponasality, and also a way to recognize when it's important to concern yourself with and when it is not. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please just post down below. Don't forget to subscribe and share this video if you found it helpful. If you'd like to support the work we're doing on this channel, check us out over on Patreon. We're uploading a lot of really exciting content on there now. And if you'd like to work together in private lessons, just check out our website, transvoicelessons.com. And otherwise, have a beautiful rest of your day. Thank you. Bye.